Hi, welcome. Hi, everyone. Um, so, uh, who am I and why am I giving this talk? Well, I am Sarek. I used to be a master's student at the University of Oslo, and uh, this talk is about my master's thesis. So the question then becomes, what is my master's thesis? Well, this is my master's thesis, and you can find it on GitHub. Uh, so if you think this is at all interesting, feel free to check it out. I think the thesis is uh, the best one I've written, to be perfectly honest. It's only also the only one I've written, but you know, it's, it's all right, I think. Uh, and I did some cool things, I think. Uh, so hopefully it's going to be an interesting talk. Uh, I hope so. So uh, first of all, what's the thesis about? Well, it's about three verified SAT solvers, which I wrote in Rust. Uh, so the most important one is the CRSAT SAT solver, which is a conflict between clause learning SAT solver. I also wrote two other ones, Robinson and Friday, which were made mostly just to just to learn how to use uh, Grosso and, uh, and also learn how a SAT solver works. But uh, the Robinson SAT solver is, is, is somewhat interesting. Like it's, it's kind of small, but it's also kind of fast to be a DPL SAT solver. Uh, and the Friday one is just, you know, interesting if you're learning Grosso or something like that. But I'm going to, you know, mention them throughout some sometimes, but I'm not going to explain the other ones, which are not Grosso. So uh, all of the uh, solvers are verified with uh, the tool Curso, which is made by Xavier. Uh, so the question then becomes, what's a SAT solver? What is Curso? And how does one verify a SAT solver? So that's hopefully going to be covered by this talk, along with some other things. Uh, so what's this talk about, or how am I going to structure it? Well, it's largely going to be about SAT and uh, SAT solving. And there's uh, multiple reasons for that. First reason is, uh, I don't think it's possible to learn Curso or stuff like that in any useful way if you're doing presentations you sort of have to do the proofs have to experience the pain and have to sort of like just keep at it same as with programming and the second is that if you want to understand the proof you really need to understand the algorithm uh, so i'm going to talk mostly about like how to understand the sat solving algorithm and also the sat solving algorithm is, or the cdcl algorithm is in my opinion quite quite interesting just in and of itself and i <laughs> i hope i can convince you uh, that it is it's also a review of Curso, and uh, this is the first like major usage of Curso. So, so it's also a review of that. And so I've tried to make the talk that I wish I had seen a year ago before before I even started this stuff. Um, so hopefully it's going to be accessible to, to most people. Maybe it's going to be on the easy side for people who know verification or who know SAT solving. But I hope that I can and sort of like hit everyone basically. Like everybody's going to get something out of it. And as always, if you have any questions throughout, just uh, turn on your camera and, and ask uh, or put it in the chat. I think camera is better. Um, so yeah, first, why did I make the thesis? And and I have sort of presented this in multiple different ways. And sometimes I said like, yeah, it would have been really nice to make a, a verified stat solver. And that's kind of true, but it's not the reason why I started the thesis. The reason why I was, like, was because I was into formal methods and also like annoyed at things. It's sort of like, well, if you're gonna do verification, then then and you want it to be fast, like what's your options? It's like good luck verifying C or C plus plus, and also good luck doing anything else and getting it to the same speed as C. And it's like, of course, it's possible, but it's it's kind of hard, and and uh, you're probably gonna spend a lot of time just getting the performance there. It's like, okay, but Rust has all these guarantees. It would be really nice to you know be able to provide a few more guarantees. And uh, luckily, I came across uh, Xavier's talk. Uh, at last year's rest verify and I thought, oh yeah, this is it. Like this is real nice. This is like sort of the thing I've been looking at. But you know, nobody has used this. So like maybe it's just a, a, a proof of concept tool, which is not possible to do anything useful in it. But uh, I sent him a mail and said, hey, I thought your talk was cool. Do you think it's possible to do a master's thesis? And he said, yeah, of course. And then we discussed a bit, and and this is the result um, of that that mail. So if you wanna if you wanna spend time on Perfect SATs or stuff like that, just send mails to people and uh, that's going to happen. So, yeah, why do I want to verify a SATs? Well, I've previously said, that, oh, it's been really nice to have a verified SATs. And that's sort of like true. Like, proof certificates are sort of like subpar. And if you could skip them, that would be nice. But it's also because I needed an application which was pretty complex, interesting in it and of itself. And I needed an application where speed was useful and where correctness was was useful. And, and all that applies to a SATs. So, that's sort of like why. Why I went the route I did and why I got interested into this and uh, why I ended up making the verified SAT solvers. So the question then becomes, what is Crusoe? 
Uh, and I believe many of you have seen the talks previously by, by um, Xavier. If you don't, then I recommend checking him out on, on YouTube. Just search Xavier Denise or Gerso, and it's going to come up. Um, so, so it is a deductive verifier for REST. It's developed by Xavier. So that code satisfies a specification. Uh, it's based on, on translating REST and the specifications to YML, which is then sent to the Ytree platform. Uh, and the Ytree platform labels a lot of SMT solvers and lots of proof transformations. And it's overall, I would argue, quite an, a, a very powerful tool. Of course, like the GTK uh, ID and everything could be better, but, but the tool in itself is very powerful in my opinion. I'll just do a quick demo. So I'm not going to show anything like super interesting. I just thought, well, I'll uh, I'll show uh, a proof of this. So this is Friday, the super naive solver. So this is sort of how it looks. You annotate with requires and ensures, uh, and also for the loops, you add invariants. Uh, and the code, the rest of the code is the same as usual. And uh, then um, you can run, for instance, uh, if you use the repo, you just run the cargo make command. And then it's gonna make the uh, YML and it's gonna be sent to the Y3 IDE. So this is the Y3 IDE. And uh, here we have all of the proof goals. So if you try this one and just run three on it, then it's proven. You can also do a split. And this one didn't have anything interesting, but let's see if any of the other ones have. So some of these have subconditions, um, which can be verified. So if you just um, verify the root node, then it's gonna run for a bit of time on the SMT solvers and then it checks out. So that's sort of the how to use this. And you can just think of this as a black box where we write annotations in the source code and then it gets sent here and, and somehow gets proven. And uh, all of the stuff I'm going to be talking about is proven in this and, and believe the, the proof objects which are in GitHub should be up to date. If they're not, I'm going to update them later. Um, they have been checking out previously at least. Um, so that's your result. So what is a SAT solver? And uh, I know that a lot of you probably know what a SAT solver is, but again, I'm doing this presentation for, for me a year ago and I didn't really know what a SAT solver is. So I'm going to explain them quite, you know, uh, I, I, as if you didn't know what it is. So what is a SAT solver? A SAT solver is a program which solves the Boolean satisfiability problem. It takes as input a Boolean formula in CNF, conjunctive normal form, and outputs either SAT or unsat, depending on if the formula is satisfiable or not. So for example, this formula consisting of three clauses, the first one has a single literal, the A, uh, and the second one has two literals, and the last one has one literal. Well, that's unsat because there's no way to satisfy all of these three clauses at the same time. But if, it, if we change the first clause a bit by adding a new literal, C, then it becomes sat, it's satisfiable. We just uh, assign C to true, and then we satisfy uh, the middle one by satisfying not A, and then we satisfy the last one. Uh, well, I said it's fine, not me. And uh, these uh, clauses would contain only one literal are called unit clauses. And we're going to come back to these later. So there are multiple algorithms for solving SAT. And these classifications here, um, probably some people are going to disagree with me. Um, I believe they are. Uh, no, no. So disregard that it says CDCL on, on the second one. That's supposed to be GPLL. That's a copy paste error uh, on my part. So anyhow, so for the search based algorithms, you have the brute force algorithm, which is just try everything. And this is the Friday super naive verified SAT solver. And then we have the DPLL. So here where it says CDCL, it should say DPLL algorithm. And that's from 1962. And that's verified in a Robinson algorithm. And that is basically brute force, but you can do two intelligent, intelligent things. The first one is pure literal elimination, which means that if a literal occurs with only one polarity, we can remove it entirely from the formula. You can just always say to try the true or false, and then uh, all its occurrences can be removed. And the second thing is unit propagation. So those units I recall about, I mentioned earlier, which were uh, clauses with only one literal, well, there's only one way to satisfy that. You have to set that literal to whatever it polarity of the variable is uh, to satisfy the clause. And, and let's say you have a, a very long clause and then all of its um, literals except one is are unsatisfied. Well, then you have to set the last one to satisfy the entire clause. And what often happens is you get a propagation of units. So one 
unit leaves a new unit leaves a new leaves a unit, and so that that's the one family of of uh, of sad solving algorithms. It should be mentioned that there are more than the ones that I mentioned here, uh, but these are like the complete ones and and the ones that I have looked at. Uh, which are search based, and this has implications for how we need to do the proof because you have to prove that you're doing an exhaustive search over the search space. And the second one are the ones I call resolution based, and this is where people might disagree and say that CDCL is is an extension of DPLL, and I don't believe it is because it's not based on the complete exploration of the search space; it's based on resolution. So. Um, the other algorithm, which is also based on resolution, is the Davis Putnam algorithm from 1960, which is based on exhaustive resolution, whereas CDCL is based on what I call lazy resolution, which essentially means that you are doing all these kinds of things, you're making choices and everything, doing unit propagation. And then if you have to, if you get stuck, if you get a conflict, uh, conflict driven, so if you get a conflict, well, then you do the close learning, which is just resolution. So that's why I call it lazy resolution. And it also has like this mental model has implications for how you end up doing the proof. Uh, so yeah, the main idea is that you learn from failures. You learn from conflicts, so you don't do the same failure twice. Uh, and that's verified in the in the CURSAT um CCL solve. So unit progression. I've already explained it sort of. I'll just give an, a brief example because it occurs in both TPL and CDCL. Um, and as mentioned, it is code-wise or it, it is proof-wise the same, as I mentioned. No, very different, as I mentioned. But it is code-wise exactly the same. Uh, let's look at how it works. So this is just an example formula. And here we see not B, or the clause containing not B, is a unit clause. Well, there's only one way to satisfy that clause. So we don't have to try B, which means that we can simplify and get this new formula. And then we get a new unit clause. And then we can, again, do the same thing, simplify, and then we have a new unit clause, which just contains the little C, and then we remove that, and that is, of course, that. It's the empty formula, and the empty formula is trivially satisfied. So that's what, you, what was unit propagation. Now I'm going to talk about the meat of the subject, which is conflict-driven clause learning. So what is conflict-driven clause learning? Well, as I mentioned, it's just iterated application of the resolution procedure. Well, the question then becomes, what is resolution? And this is the sort of point where a lot of you are going to know what resolution is, but I didn't really because I'd skipped that course where they discussed resolution, which was a big, uh, big shame. Spent a bit of time realizing that it's oh, it's just resolution and it's really nice. So I'll explain it as if you don't know what it is. So if you have two clauses, C and C marked, such that the exact one literal, which occurs with opposite polarities in the two clauses, well, then we can create a new clause which is such that all of the clauses of the new clause are either from C or from C marked, and none of the literals are the resolvent, the, the literal which we have resolved that. So what happens is we remove one literal and get a new clause, which is the, um, the union of the two, of the remaining literals of the clauses. So um, as an example, super simple example, if we have A or B and we have not B or C, well, then we can do resolution on uh, B and get a new clause, which is A or C. And if you think about this sort of, sort of like this, not just syntactically, if you think about it like what has to happen, well, we have to satisfy A or B and we have to satisfy not B or C. Okay, well, to satisfy the first clause, um, and, and let's say B is falsified, well, then A is true. And for the second clause, well, let's say not B is falsified, well, then C has to be true. So we end up getting this. And this is like sort of like the core part of proving the whole CDC algorithm. You prove resolution and then you put a bunch of optimizations on it. But that's sort of like the core. So you start with resolution and then you build upon that. So the question then becomes we're doing clause learning. Okay, but where do you get the clauses to do resolution of? Well, um, so as I mentioned, iterated resolution, yada, yada, all that kind of stuff. Where did the clauses to resolution come from? Well, I'm glad you asked. They come from unit propagation. And that's sort of like the beauty of. Of the CDCL algorithm is that when you have when you're doing the unit propagation, you have a clause which consists of a bunch of unsatisfied literals and a single unset literal. Well, if you satisfy that one and keep track that you did that, so you say, okay, here's the literal I just assigned. I just satisfied this clause by uh, assigning this to either true or false. And then remember, here's this clause which contains all of this other stuff. If you ever get a new clause which contains uh, the literal. 
well, then you can do resolution. And you know you can do resolution if, you can, if it contains the uh, little bit opposite clarity, then you can do resolution because then you know that the other class, the class you're looking up into, uh, contains that literal. So that's sort of like the, the beauty of it. It's only we're just doing all of these things and we're doing unit propagation. And unit propagation is an efficient way to search to, do, to search the search space. And it's also an efficient way to populate the trail, which is an efficient way to find clauses to do resolution on. And this is also an implication for when you do the proof, because it ends up being mostly just maintaining the trail, maintaining the trail invariance, and making sure that um, that every every single operation in your in your uh, in your chat solver maintains all the invariance, especially the trail invariance, which ends up being a, a huge block of code. And Xavier said to me, "You can't show them the trail invariance." I'm like, okay, okay, well, oh well. But uh, you can look at it on GitHub. It's a lot of uh, it's ugly code, proper ugly code. And that's why I have not shouldn't shouldn't show it. So I already explained the trail. I'll explain it once more. This is a data structure which keeps track of the order of the strings were assigned, and this enables efficient backtracking. And the reason for each assignment, and that's the functionality I mentioned just now, that you can if you are giving given any literal, then you can look up and see why was this literal assigned. And and remember when you get a conflict, we are in a clause which is all false, which means that if we check any literal and we find something which was a unit at some point, so it was uh, some at some time populated by unit propagation, then we know that we can do a resolution on it because we have uh, we have a clause which is all sat no or all unsat except the one literal which was forced by unit propagation. And because that is of opposite polarity, we are sure that we have no other literals which occur, uh, which which could uh, ruin the precondition that is exactly one literal uh, of opposite polarity in the two clauses. So that's how that's how close learning works. That's how uh, how the proof ends up uh, working basically. So yeah, this means and um, what I just said: if we have an unsat clause, we can efficiently find clauses to do resolution on. And uh, it is also what enables efficient backtracking because we keep this in a stack. So uh, that's basically the idea behind CDCL. And once you have that idea, sort of like how you have to prove CDCL falls out. Sort of like, okay, well, well, well th those are the ideas. We just have to make code which implements that, or we have to make a specification which implements that. So we need to prove course learning. And well, what do we need to prove? Well, we need to prove that resolution needs a clause which is implied by the formula. So we just have to prove the resolution procedure. And we have to uh, prove that the preconditions of resolution are maintained by the clause learning loop. So when we are doing clause learning, we are doing resolution, 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 resolution for however long we want to do. And in practice, in practice, you, you'd you stop at what's called the first unique implication point. We can stop whenever you want. And that's sort of also like the beauty of it. So you could just do it once and then do restart and learn a class and do it once and do a restart and, and learn a class and, and, and keep on doing that. And you're going to eventually find a solution. It's not going to be very efficient, but it's going to work. But, but, but that's also like the second nice thing is that you can keep doing this class learning loop however long you want, as long as you are uh, maintaining the, the preconditions throughout. And the precondition for this is essentially that the clause you are working on is always a conflict clause. Which it ends up being because you are resolving out the only literal which could have been uh, satisfied because you're resolving out literal which was uh, which was the resolving which was true in one clause and and false in one clause and and the rest were were all in sets and that's that's sort of like the beauty of, of the whole algorithm and also how the proof ends up being quite in my opinion quite easy once you get the get sort of the idea and of course. Uh, the second thing is that all of the operations you do in your SAT solver have to maintain the necessary invariance. And the absolutely most important of these is the trailing variant, which also ends up being the largest invariant by, by far. So, so there are more things in, in terms of the structure of the trail and, and making sure that um, it is well formed. But, but the most important thing is that it sort of like keeps this mapping and that everything which is in there has this property, which I call post unit. Which is just that it was a unit clause, which is now satisfied, meaning that it has exactly one literal, which is true. And that enables you to get a resolution and thus do the whole proof, which enables the proof of CDCL to work. And so, yeah, that's it, kind of. Uh, so, 
of course, there are things I have just glossed over. Um, because again, I don't believe you're going to like me just showing you a lot of code. It's just going to be confusing. So, and um, modern stats all needs a bunch of extra stuff to be fast, and efficient data structures, and efficient resolution operation. So, if you look at the current resolution operation, you're not going to see the one I described. I started by implementing like just with like do iterated resolution, and then I've optimized it so that I keep track of a a, a vector of scene, so which is the current. Uh, elements and so on to do efficient resolution but it is the same idea it's an optimization of the implementation uh search restarts uh need them uh you need uh, either bmtf or um, bsids this is heuristic and uh, you need uh, going to need two bot literals and going to need target faces and so on you're going to need a bunch of stuff and these are what i would call like the core stuff and then have like things like false minimization and uh, other things which would definitely help a lot but they're less important uh and uh yeah so most of these can be treated entirely separately uh the question then is most and there's one major um exception which is two watch literals um which is a real pain and uh i was initially thinking like okay i'll i'll, I'll prove everything you know that's nice and everything i'm sorry could you just very quickly explain what two watch literals are yeah, so I thought I'd, I'd cheat you out on that and say, you want to fall, you know, know what that is, uh, then uh, and read the thesis. Nah. So the, the two words literal idea is, is kind of simple. It's a very like clever idea, but it's kind of simple. And it's uh, what makes it clever is that it's super efficient when you're doing backtracking. So the observation is if you have a, a clause, any clause, and it contains at least two literals which are not set then it cannot be unit. So let's say it's 150 literals long and you're just watching two of the literals. Uh, usually by convention, you're watching the first two literals. Um, then if anything is, is done, anything is set, maybe it becomes satisfied. Okay, but, but you know for sure that it cannot be a unit, which means that you're only visiting the clause whenever one of the, um, one of the two watch literals are assigned. And actually, you're only visiting it when the opposite lottery of the watch literal is assigned. So only when uh, the watch literal is falsified do you actually visit the clause. And and whenever you visit the clause, either you find, oh, it has become satisfied. So you just update the watches, and then now it's like, okay, now it's a satisfied clause. Or you will discover that it has become unit because um, because the, the, the other watch, the, the watch, the watch which it did not visit has has uh, become the only unset literal in the clause, or uh, you find that it has become a conflicting clause, and that happens when in one one run of unit propagation, multiple clauses end up uh, with the same with the same literals or with the same variables. So, um, so that that means that by the time that you get to update your first watch, your second watch has also been. Uh, falsified. So that's how two watch literals um, work. And the reasons why uh, the reason why two watch literals is hard is multiple things. The first is, well, well, well you have to prove that that you are watching the entire, you have to like, first of all, you have to prove just the structure of it, that if you were to watch all of these things, that your uh, unit propagation mechanism would be a complete evaluation mechanism, or exactly, it would be a complete evaluation mechanism if uh, if you all also added the knowledge of whether or not you had any more assignments left to do. So that's sort of like the issue with, which happens is your decision procedure returns and says there's no more decisions to do. We're, we're fully assigned. And that information combined with the information that your unit propagation did not return a, a conflict has to be added together to, to say, okay, well, well, that means that we are sat which means we can just return sat. And the problem to do that is that you have to prove that you're watching the entirety of the formula, or at least you're watching the entirety of uh, the input formula, or um, what's it called? Uh, the irredundant, the irredundant uh, part of the formula. So you have to watch all of the clauses, which if they were to be evaluated, would you give you a complete evaluation of, of the input formula or some implication of the input formula. Um, and that's 
both hard just to prove like in, in itself and it's hard to maintain the property throughout that you're watching all of the redundant clauses and there's that unit propagation is a complete uh, evaluation function that if your compl uh, unit propagation mechanism returns and does not result in the conflict that, that means that um, you are indeed not conflict so that's towards the drills and also why it's hard uh, and I'm not sure it would have taken me 15 months. Maybe it would have taken me more for all I know. Maybe it would have taken me less. But but it was sort of like, okay, it's it's probably risky. It's probably going to be hard anyways. I'm probably going to be spending a lot of time. Is it going to give me anything like substantial, which I really would want? No, not really, because it would only give me completeness. It would not change the soundness of the, of the solver. So that's the first thing. And the second is, um, it will also introduce it would make everything super slow because you would have to maintain this property throughout. Every single move would have to be have to maintain this property. And and when I initially did the proof, I, I did not want to introduce such like a sluggishness or, or whatever you want to call it. Like a, I didn't want syrup. I didn't want my code to become completely syrupy. So now if I were to change the code a bit, then maybe I would like try it again. I'm not, you know, explaining I'm going to do this, but, but I, I would, I would now be more comfortable with with proving it, just because uh, I would not have anything against you know the code becoming slower to work with uh, in a bit. But but back then it was like no brainer to do this. So, anyways, I have alluded to the fact that I have cheated because I did not have fifty months, so I cheat and I had a runtime check. So this only happens when you are when you achieve a satisfying assignment. So that means that. When your unit propagation mechanism returns without a conflict, so somehow we are called unit propagation, it did not return a conflict. Then, because we're not proving the whole two words literal structure, we have to check are we indeed complete? Have we indeed assigned every single one? And uh, that has to be checked, anyways, no matter if you prove this or whatever. And does there exist only SAT clauses or like all of the clauses SAT? So just run a, a linear check for for if all of the clauses are set uh, once and then uh, and then we return set and if not then we return an error and um, so that means that completeness is sacrificed um, which is of course you know uh, uh, undesirable um, but I'm I'm sort of like unhappy with my trade off I believe it was the correct choice uh, yeah so heading on to to results um, by the way if there's any more questions to this previous part then uh, feel free. So uh, results, what did I implement? Implemented towards literals with blocking literals and circular search. So those are just two optimizations which you can add. I've later realized that circular search is perhaps not worth it, but you know, it, it helps a bit. Um, and the VMTF or variable move to front decision heuristic. Um, I later realized that I, I did this partly wrong or it is entirely correct, but uh, it is uh, a bit suboptimal because I'm bumping a part of the wrong variables so when i swapped it to vsids which is the other one uh, the solver became significantly faster so i'm doing something wrong on the vmgf front but it works and it's 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 pretty fast it's like uh yeah it's fast fast ish it's just not it could have been faster uh implement a technique called face saving which is just remembering the same uh literal or the same polarity as previously assigned um and uh, for those in the SAT space know that target faces is a new cool thing. And uh, I should have, retrospectively, I should have added target faces. And that's basically just an optimization on face saving. Or really it isn't. It really, target faces is a a way to uh, update your heuristics based on the problem you are given. So you see what works and what doesn't work and, and update it. And also just trying a bunch of different things. So you have faces where you are doing um, fewer restarts, we're doing more frequent restarts where you're trying a local search solver and so on. Uh, and it's, it's really good. It's, uh, I severely underestimated how good it is as a technique. Uh, and of course, backtracking and to what's called the assertion, asserting level and uh, exponential moving averages based restarts, also known as glucose based restarts, which is just some numbers based on the literal block distance uh, of, of recently learned clauses. Um, and and you update those numbers or two different averages, and then uh, you do research. Uh, and proof wise, all of these things except the two words literals are quite easy. And of course, I also implement cost deletion, 
but I don't implement the garbage collection because I haven't gotten around to that yet, basically. But it's not a problem because I haven't had any any memory issues. So uh, what do I prove? Let's look at the top level specifications. And this is also part of the presentation where it's not it's not meant so much as, as you know, uh, know all of these things. It's more like this is sort of like how much you would have to agree with me that that something is true. So I'm not going to show all of this. This is the top level specification for the unsat. So this is the entry point of the solver, which turns a sat result. And here we can see that it has some other thing, some er error enum, um, which is because it's incomplete. Uh, so if we look at what is what's the specification of unsat, well, that means that the final formula, so this is the, the hat, is the final operator. The final formula is not satisfiable. And the initial formula is equisatisfiable with the final formula. So that's sort of like intuitively what I would argue is, is uh, the way to represent it in, in, in the CDC on SAS solver. Um, but then you have to check, okay, well, what's not satisfiable? Well, not satisfiable, it's there exists a clause of length zero, and that clause is an equisatisfiable extension of the formula. So, so you're just saying that the formula is equisatisfiable with the empty form. Okay, or with the empty empty clause, which is by definition unsatisfiable. Um, which is because we have derived uh, the empty clause as a as a consequence of the empty form. Um, so the question then becomes: Well, this at sign was that? Well, that's the model of a clause. But what's the model of the clause? Well, it's the model of its literal, literals, and and so on. So you have to go up through all of this, um, and 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 sort of like check and manually verify. So the same applies to equisite extension, which is also a wrapper to to this inner function, and you have to check that and so on. But in total, this is sort of like the forty-seven lines. It's like the additional specification you have to verify just for uh, unsat, uh, because I put equisat in a different one. Uh, so this is the specification for equisat, and that's shared between uh, sat and unsat. So the same sort of applies to this. So it was 47 lines in total for previous one, and 81 lines of, of this kind of code for this one. And then for the last one, we have uh, we have 51 lines, and of course some of this is the same as in white lines. But but I would argue that when you condense down a, a SAT solver to to less than 200 lines of specification code, 150 lines of specification code, really. And and it's sort of like, this is just a, a, a trait implementation. It's a generic like boilerplate trait. Um, I would argue that, you know, it's a pretty substantial game and uh, people can, of course, go through this and, and See if I have made any mistakes, but I don't. I don't believe so. I, I have looked over it, and I've also had other people look over it. So, uh, that's uh, yeah. So that's sort of like top level specification for the SAT. We just have formula that SAT that inner for under this assignment. So that just we have found a satisfying assignment, and the final formula is exactly satisfiable with with the input form. So yeah, um, let list. So that's the top level specifications. Uh, so, okay, so should have said results here, but uh, this is the results section where uh, we are comparing as Cresat and also uh, Robinson, the DPLL solver, with a few other results. So the first one is TrueSat, which is a Daphne based solver, uh, which is a DPL solver. It was made, uh, yes? A question from dot dot in chat. Um, is it possible to cheat the proofs? For example, return unimplemented or maybe loop so nothing gets returned? Loops are possible because termination is not guaranteed, right? Uh, unimplemented, I have not uh, tried. Should, should crash? Unimplemented should should raise an error. It should raise an error. Yeah, raise an error, right? Yeah. I don't know. I, Oh, sorry, I mean, it should not be verifiable, rather. Yeah, it should um, not be verifiable. So, so it shouldn't be possible. The exception is, of course, you know, if you have an infinite loop, then an infinite loop can prove anything, right? Um, so, yeah. 
So because we're not because I'm not proving uh, termination and not proving like, how do I remember this shit? I'm trying to remove the chat. It's in the middle of my screen. Uh, yes, so um, we could cheat by having infinite loops, and because I don't prove determination, uh, I couldn't really have proven anything. So that's also why we need these things. We need to have sort of like a statistical guarantee that that it does actually return stuff. So I have proven that if it returns anything, then whatever it returns is correct. Um, but I have not proven that it actually has to return anything for every single input. Uh, so yeah, I'll be comparing it to these three SAT solvers, and there are more verified SAT solvers than these ones. Um, but these ones are the least bad ones, uh, I would say. So there's a few like uh, cock implementations from 2010 or 2008 to 2010 that area, and the PBS implementation, and uh, and uh, yeah, also a a Haskell implementation, which I completely missed originally because they just talk about pigeonhole problems and stuff. Um, but I didn't include that because it goes, it runs out of memory immediately, basically immediately. So I, I don't know how fast it is. It, it, it runs out of memory. Maybe it is super fast, but uh, it's impossible to check for any any usable input because uh, somehow it, both me and other people, I got out of memory already. So. Um, so I'll be comparing it to Versat, which is a C to CL SAT solver and made in the guru dependently type language. And this is that, which is uh, the best uh, verified SAT solver made in Isabel uh, over a number of years by the previously mentioned guy, Matthias Fleury. And it's a uh, really an impressive feat of, of, of code, I, I must say. Uh, yeah. So anyhow, this is uh, just random three set instances comparing mostly just Robinson with three sets. Uh, so this is sort of like if you're making a verified SAT solver in Daphne versus if you're making it in Rust, well, it's going to be faster in Rust. And also Chris Hatt is going to be faster because of the C to CL algorithm. That's just how it works. Um, yeah. So as we can see, uh, Robinson is like three to five times as fast uh, on on these instances. Um, but it's sort of like the, the use case for uh, DPL solvers is not huge. So I included the pigeonhole problems because that's the one space where the DPL solvers are actually faster. And, and as we can see, Robinson is faster than Crusat and also faster than, than Trusat. Um, but it's also like, okay, the, the use case for, for pigeonhole problem solvers is like, it's quite limited, I would argue. But anyways, it's, it's decently fast, quite happy. Um, and here are the more interesting ones. So these are uh, this is the table which is included in the thesis, uh, in which case I made an error. So this is the fixed one. So I this is all of the submitted problems, and this is the, all of the accepted problems. This is all of the problems which were included in in the actual competition. So I just took all of the ones which were on Star Exec, which is this run your SAT solver in the cloud the service, uh, and I didn't think much about what kinds of things or what kind of problems there were. So this is the proper set from 2015, uh, removed the 251, which were not accepted. And yeah, and I also included this uh, green one, fixed heuristics plus target faces. And that's per sat with, uh, with, with less bad heuristics and also added the target faces. So uh, that's a lot closer. And, um, and uh, I sh sh should have just done that because it wouldn't have been all that hard, but um, oh well, too bad. So uh, there's a couple of things to note, I think. Uh, first one is, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's decent. It's a lot better than Burst at in the SAT instance, but it's also not that great at the end SAT case. And I have sort of like thought about like why, why that is. And I'm not entirely sure because I haven't like solved it. I'm like, figured out like okay, now it's definitely faster on the end SAT case. Uh, I think it may be in part because it doesn't use uh, clause arenas, which means that uh, it just gets because on the end side case you just have to run till completion. You just have to do a, a series of resolution steps, which ends up in the in the empty clause, and and which means that on this side case you just have to get lucky once. You just you know, like yeah, I found one, and, and then that's good. So that means that uh, things like uh, target faces and and frequent restarts and so on is quite beneficial. But but 
overall, it is in some sense uh, a bit of a slow solver because it doesn't have an efficient way to get the clauses from the clause database, which all the other solvers basically have. Um, so, so that may be it. It also is, of course, impacted by the fact that it does not have clause minimization. But for instance, Versa doesn't have clause minimization either. Um, so, so that's that, that impacts it. But uh, I am uh, surprised that the difference is as it is. So I'm not sure why it is um, so slow. So if we compare it to Microsoft, then you know, Microsoft doesn't have clause minimization either. Um, but it has a, a faster a faster way to access the clauses, which may explain the difference between 37 and 29 on the untokens. So uh, anyhow, that's enough about the problem of the solvers. Let's talk about replication times. So all of this is kudos to Xavier. Of course, I've written the code. So maybe it, it could have been a lot slower. Maybe it could have been a lot faster. I don't know. Uh, but it, it is, in my opinion, quite fast, surprisingly fast, actually. So for Robinson, it takes like 24 seconds to do the proof discovery. And for TrueSat, which is the verified DPL solver in, in Daphne, it takes 96 seconds. And that is down for like two hours originally. And then later he, he did some changes and got it down to like 10 minutes, something like that. And I believe the paper. And then since it's gone down to 96 seconds. So impressive work by, by him getting it down. Uh, but still like without you know me, me putting a lot of effort, it ends up being faster than Christo, which is really cool, I think. And the same applies to to Crossat. It takes uh, roughly 15 minutes to do the full proof discovery, and and doing the same thing in Isabel in Isasat takes two hours and four minutes, and and really your machine is going 100% when Isabel is running groups. So so I was quite surprised like that how how much time it takes for Isasat to, to build, uh, and and how little time it takes for Crossat. Especially since I believe there's there's significant gain to be had, like it can be made faster. Um, which is cool. I think it's a good result. Uh, so kudos to Xavier. Uh, code size uh, ends up being quite small. So so Robinson, uh, with everything, is one, two, three, four lines compared to the previous uh, DPL solver, which is you know comparable in Daphne, which is over three thousand lines. And and much of this is due to a lower proof overhead. So the proof overhead of of Chrysopris is roughly two to one, which is quite good. And the same applies to Crossat, which is a bit over 4,000 lines with, with proofs and, and code, and uh, also a proof over the roughly two to one. And if you read the thesis, then you will see that I, I wrote the wrong thing because I don't, I, I know how to verify SAT solves and stuff, but I don't know how to count. So so I, I counted wrong and I uh, put in the wrong overhead, like the relative overhead. So it says four to one in the thesis, but the correct one, if we do Tokyo, is, is uh, closer to two to one. And uh, finally, there's uh, there's a Versat, which is made in Guru, around 10,000 lines, also a proof overhead. This is as stated by the author. I haven't actually verified this. Uh, 4 to 1. And for Isasat, I'm not sure. It's 100, roughly 150,000 lines. Um, and uh, of course, some of this is, is efficient code generation to LLVM. Some of this is implementation. Um, but that's roughly where it is. Uh, I compared to Isasat 30, which is performance-wise comparatively the same ballpark as Chrysat. Um, and that's around around 104,000 lines of code, uh, or Isabel proof script that is. So uh, you get a, you get a pretty short proof, pretty short code, I think. So and and it checks out fast. Good work. Yeah. So that leads me to Crusoe review. Yeah. So does it have any consequences on the code itself? And that's that's a question that I've been asked a couple of times, and I think it's a a, a like good question. Like, is the verified code idiomatic? And of course, I don't know. Like, uh, do I even write idiomatic code? Perhaps. I hope so. Uh, my answer is kind of, in some sense, yeah. Uh, you ha it has some consequences in the sense that you are optimizing not for readability or performance, anything like that. You're optimizing for minimal proof pain. So, you, so you want to prove to check out, you know, at, uh, preferably today, but you know, sometime uh, quite soon. Um, and and you want it to be maintainable. And you want the SMT solvers to be happy. So you end up doing all these kind of like decisions, which which enables that, enables less proof pain, maybe a bit, bit longer writing time and, and everything. But if it is marginally smaller pain, then it's marginally better. And that's or much, much, much better. And that's really nice. So this means that crazy code becomes super painful, like sort of like C, C++ code, like pervasive mutability kind of code and not that you can do all that much in rest anyways but like 
it, it forces you further down, like this is the proper way to do it in Rust way, which I think is really nice. So it sort of like ends up being quite close, like a functional programming style, which I think is good. Like it's, I would argue it's quite idiomatic. Um, it also results in nested loops becoming a loop with a function call. Um, and that's sort of like this, my preference. I just find maintaining Dublin nested is, it's much more of a pain. It's fine when it's, it's two, anything more than two, then, then, you know, you're better off. So basically all of my loops are loop function called a new loop. So some of my things are just called unit prop loop, which is just the body of the unit prop version. Um, because you can just prove that separately. And that's really, you know, it, it's a nice thing to do, but nobody would do that in proper code. Uh, and functions become smaller, which I think is mostly good, right? So you end up separating everything out to make it more modular. Uh, the main exception to this is that a dot swap from the standard library is wrapped in a function called swap because I need to ensure of this invariant. So I uh, do the swap, or before I do the swap, I take a ghost of the previous vector and then I uh, do some assertions, I do the swap, and I do some more assertions. And that enables the SMT servers to find uh find that i am maintaining the invariance whenever i'm doing a swap which is completely like no, nobody would ever do this and also some representations are impossible like i have not found a way to to represent those things and also prove them so uh the my bad uh so the main example for like an impossible thing is, is the previous trade invariant so when I was in Munich at Rust Verify, I was very close to verifying. I just like lacked the the, um, the trail, uh, and that was because I had chosen like a, a two dimensional trail where each uh, where each decision level. So each time you make a decision, you increase the decision level, uh, where each decision level was like a vector. So we had decision level level zero, decision level one, decision level two, and so on. Uh, upwards, and that has some benefits and some uh, some disadvantages. But proof-wise, I cannot get it to work. And the reason for that was because I had nested existential quantifiers for SMT solvers, and they did not like that. It just doesn't seem like they like that. So I rewrote the entire thing to not use that trail, to use a different trail, and I've proven everything else with regards to this trail. This this uh, very nice trail in all other ways, except I couldn't get the backtracking mechanism to work. I couldn't get it to restore uh, the invariants I needed. So I just scratched it and, and made a new trail. And that was easier to me than, than you know, finding a proof. And uh, I have looked at, you know, like afterwards if it was possible and, and it just seemed like it would become too hard. And of course I am inexperienced, maybe it is possible, but it is also sort of like some things are just, just become disproportionately hard uh, in terms of what you get. And, uh, like, I don't think the new trail is any slower. I think it actually is faster. And also there's some nice things like, things like for loops and const and question mark operator and stuff like that. And that's sort of like a given, but like I have a bunch of while loops. Most people would use for loops. I would also prefer to use for loops, but you know, it, it, it is what it is. I get looping constructs. Uh, they're good. Overall, very impressed as I've alluded to. Double tough stuff for me, good, good, good work. Um, and uh, I would argue that very fine detail is close to being in the realm of trivial. And what I consider like the realm of trivial is sort of like, uh, you can have this as like a, as a homework assignment in, in an undergraduate course, right? If you have like some, some lectures and stuff like that, um, which I think is really like, I don't think it has been before. Uh, and, and of course I'm super biased. So maybe this is like entirely wrong, but I, I think like very plain detail now in Crusoe is not, is not all, all that hard. And, and it was kind of hard when I did it. Actually, I found it to be peak hardness harder than CDCL. Uh, and, and basically the reason for that is a combination of SMT solvers be getting better and also just Crusoe getting better. So I, uh, I did the proof everything, uh, and I was super like stuck. And then I, um, and then I was like, ah, why well, I had to find all of these assertions and all, all of these lemons and so on. And then I revisited it later, just to clean it up. And I started removing stuff and it kept checking out, kept checking out. I was like. Oh, so a lot of the like lemmas weren't actually needed. It just the SMT solvers didn't find a proof previously, and now they do. Okay, yeah, super nice, and and that basically made it from, in my opinion, quite difficult, hard for me at least, to okay, this is you know perfectly doable for 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 most people. Realm of trivial. It's of course like a, a very subjective thing, and I don't believe that this is the case in Daphne. 
um, I may be wrong, but it is just based on, on the true SAT implementation, just like how long it becomes, how long it takes, how much work has been put in, uh, how, uh, like, how, how how slow it was originally when it checked out and, and how uh, how fast it is now, like how much work has gone into that and how many limits they need or seem to need and, and so on. It just seems like it is a lot more work. Like it ends up being almost three times as long. Um, so I think that's cool. Of course, it's super subjective. I mean, I'll just, you know, find this guy and so on. Uh, and and I would argue that very famous in the is is in, in the realm of undergraduate course products. So it's, it's fairly difficult, but like if you, if you have like a, a decently structured course, then then it should be entirely possible. Um, so yeah, and I think that's pretty cool. Uh, I'm not sure I would have said that like a year ago. So so um, yeah, uh, very like impressed with with Crystal. Um, and and yeah, I think it would be a, a good a good undergrad course actually. To verify these things, uh, though that's good. Um, so it still feels like C, and with that I mean I like you have this um, this feeling when you're writing C, which is sort of like oh I want a source function. Okay, I'll have to write my own or get my own from some 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 previous implementation. And oh I want a hash map. Okay, I'll have to write my own or I have to get one. And the same sort of applies here. It's sort of like Oh, I need I need a sorting function which takes tuples. Okay, well, uh, um, I'll have to write it. Oh, I need the sorting function which reverses. Oh, I'll have to write it myself and prove it myself. Um, because sort of like, even if you were to make a foreign specification for the sorting function, okay, well, how does that interact when you have tuples? What does it sort on? How does it interact when you're doing the reverse? Okay. You could of course prove it, but it's just sort of like it just becomes easier to just do to just make it yourself most of the time. And the same of course of, of course applies to external specification, but that's sort of like a given. You can't just trust people and say, hey, that animation probably does that. But it has this like feels like C. So whenever this this sort of like the support for standard library and so on gets improved and everything, it's gonna feel less and likely like C and more and more like the rest. And that's gonna be nice. Uh, I think the proof loop can be made much faster. And I think uh, so they argues with me on this. In the sense that uh, making a, a computer generated YML file and sending it to Y3 ID was not the intention of Y3 ID. So it takes like 45 seconds or something like that just to load it, or 50 seconds just to load it the first time when you're doing a proof. Uh, and then you have to open it up and and uh, you have to run all of the all of the SMT solvers and so on. And and there's nothing, you know, because you can just do all of these splits, there's nothing stopping you from just you know sending it and, and doing it. And maybe that's just because. I'm using it wrong. Maybe there is a better way to do it. But in, in, anyhow, it takes uh, it can, can be made faster. Uh, I would argue, and also proofs are somewhat fragile. And that's sort of like just how it is when you're generating stuff uh, using a program. But it's sort of annoying when it's like you make a tiny change and your entire proof breaks, and you have to wait 15 minutes or 20, 30 minutes just to prove. And which is verified arena allocator and uh, proper ghost code and uh, proper ghost code warning uh, i have you know this is a pine this kind this is just me here i think this will be nice i haven't done it um i think it would have been really nice because most actions in a sas solver can be modeled as either resolution or subsumption so subsumption is a lesser clause subsumes a larger clause so a subset a clause which contains consists of only a, a where the literals are a subset of the uh, other class subsumes the other class. So the simplest example of this is a unit class subsumes all classes which the literal occurs, occurs in, right? Because, oh, you have a unit class. Well, the, if you have A, then A or C, well, that's truly satisfied by A. And and with resolution, you get like the opposite. Oh, you have A, well, then not A or C becomes the new unit class C. So. So this applies to, to close minimization, this applies to close learning, this applies to a lot of the, or to bounded variable elimination, which is the preprocessor, which is essentially just the David Putnam algorithm. Uh, it applies to a lot of the things which you want to do in a SAS solver. So I think those code would have enabled more optimization and it will also be, you know, in a sense, perhaps just fun. So yeah. Um, so that's that's it to conclude what we learned. It's possible to write uh, verify SAS solvers in Rust. Uh, so that's always really just resolution, unit propagation, and the maintaining of invariants, and a bunch of other things. But but really, like I mean this, like if if you just prove resolution and prove unit propagation, then everything else is going to follow. That's sort of like the hard part in a sense, so getting it all all to work and 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 stick together and everything afterwards is 
it's challenging, but but it, it's much more doable. It's much closer to just being software engineering. I would I would argue. Uh, yeah, it's just you know you just have to do it. And uh, the absolute most important event is the turn. And also, Crystal is pretty good. Thumbs up for me. So thank you for your attention. Um, yeah, I hope it was all right. Hope you learned something. And if you didn't, then feel free to ask in the chat, and I'll be happy to to answer questions or uh, unmute yourself. Now this one is my, my microphones or my headphones died. I see in the chat that Denise verified a DPL SAT solver in YML in a CMU course. And yes, I have actually looked at that one and actually fixed one of those. Uh, yeah. Dominic, go ahead. Hey, um, very interesting talk. You talked about the trade off between making stuff easier to verify and um, like making stuff less idiomatic. Is it also like trade off between making or writing code that is less performant instead of like just only less idiomatic? Yeah, definitely. So I forgot to mention that, but, but of course, it's sort of like if I had tried to set out to make a super fast SAT solver, I would probably have made, you know, a, a quite a fast SAT solver, I, I would imagine, like, you know, probably much closer to the state of the art, I would argue. So because I am focusing on verification, I um, I don't get that. Uh, I, I, I have to do a lot more pain to get the same sort of performance. Um, so a good example of that is, is the uh, close arena. Um, which if I had no intention of verifying this, I would definitely have had a clause arena and, and I don't, uh, or clause minimization, which I have implemented, but I haven't proven, uh, bounded variable limitation, which I have implemented, but I haven't proven, and, and so on, all of these things, which is sort of like, uh, you have to think, okay, how in the world would I add this and, and how much work is that going to be? Uh, and there's, of course, always a trade-off. Now, a nice thing about a stat solver is sort of like, you can... You can verify things incrementally. So if you if you if you trust me that my implementation is correct, and then, then you can add all of these things, you know, then all of your guarantees goes out the window, but you, you have still like a, a lesser trusted base than than you would have if you have a completely unverified SAT So um yes, it has implications for how fast things become. Um yeah, definitely. Um and and uh, an example for that also is like when I implemented the first like close learning mechanism, I did like a super naive stuff with like resolution with which was actually resolution. And then as I optimization over that, I implemented all of these sort of like arrays which kept track of what was in there so that I could get all of one on a lot of my operations. And getting that was sort of like it ended up being more code, which ended up being smaller code because I had like prove and then uh, retract it or make it smaller. Whereas my original implementation of the clause learning mechanism before I had any intention of proving it was both smaller and faster than the final one. So yeah, it ends up having an impact, unfortunately. All right, thank you. I have a quick question for you, Sarek. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for your talk. And also thank you for being a uh, willing uh, guinea pig to test out Curzo on. Um, it was quite a, uh, it brought me a lot of, of help and uh, I made a lot of improvements thanks to you. Um, but I guess that you said this talk was addressed to you one year ago. Um, if you could, uh, would you tell yourself one year ago to do the same thesis that you did? If I would have done the same thesis? Yeah. In well, if, I, if, if, I, if I'd seen this talk a year ago and I would have known it already, I wouldn't have need, needed to do the thesis. But like, yeah, defo, like, yeah, 100%. I was curious. Right? I was like, hey, is this thing possible? All right, let's find out. As I said, uh, 
the proof of the pudding is in the eating and, and there ain't no pudding. Somebody just got to make the pudding. So uh, yeah, super worth it. And also learned a lot about sassos. Sassos are pretty cool. Recommended. <laughs>